Lately, the Supreme Court has been handing down some decisions that may affect how you use public land and who owns the rights to your private land. China, Russia, maybe some other country? In this video, you're gonna get those questions answered. I went down to visit somebody who's very knowledgeable in these issues. This was just one of those interesting trips. I was only there for a few hours and I got a tour of amazing old equipment that has been completely restored from the 1940s and 60s and 30s. And the answers to possibly what was the biggest land grab by the government that we've ever seen happening right now. And we're gonna do it in style because I love, what year is this? 75. This is a 75 Chevy pickup, look at that, huh? You've uh, taken care of this thing, haven't you? Oh, uh, it runs good. Looks oh mean. man, this is like a, this is, this is so clean compared to what ours used to look like. All right. Well, I thought what we do, Trinity, is I'll kind of take you around the ranch and kind of show you the operation. And I'm Kerry White. Kerry White. And my great-grandfather came here in 1864 and settled in Gallatin City with his four older brothers. And his name was Stephen. He was the youngest. He came here when he was 13. We had a ranch out on the Madison, that uh, cow-calf operation. And my great-grandfather sold that in 1868 for three cents an acre. Wow. In, in 1860, so he sold it way back then. 1868. Man, so in Gallatin City is really close to... There was no Bozeman, okay. no Belgrade, okay. no Manhattan, no Three Forks. That was the first settlement in the Gallatin Valley when John Bozeman was trailing cattle into the Gallatin Valley. And he came up here to the north, uh, well, it'd be the east end of the valley, which is where the water is, and bought this ranch up here for 10 cents an acre. And it was irrigated, and of course they had sheep and pigs and horses and cattle. And my granddad did crops, uh, wheat, barley, oats, so a lot of it's tillable. So we flood irrigate, which is a big issue because the federal government subsidized farmers to go from flood irrigation to sprinklers. You see this place over here, this is old Sherman Smith place on the right side. Mm -hmm. You'll see a big wheel line, Yep. center pivot out there. Well, the federal government gave the farmers $60,000 to put in a center pivot or wheel line and go to sprinkler irrigation and move away from flood. Well, that was great for the farmers because they could dial up on their cell phone and turn their center pivot on and they'd be irrigating. They wouldn't go out, wouldn't have to go out and change dams. They said it was more efficient putting water on the ground through sprinkler than it was through flood irrigation. But what you did was you depleted the groundwater levels. They're seeing that all over the Midwest. So this is exactly what I was talking about. And you can see that video right up here. We're talking about the fact that when efficiency, right? That's yeah. what they're doing is efficiency. And efficiency doesn't mean the best thing for the land or the people right. always. Right. So so anyway, they're, they no. shifted all this money to sprinklers, which most of that gets evaporated or goes two inches the, into the ground. That's it, right? No, there's no... There's no groundwater recharge. Right. You're it's creating no aquifers. He's talking about water that goes back down into the aquifers. Right. You're no recharge of your groundwater. And so people are having to drill more wells. So ground and groundwater is just any ground that's or any water that's below the ground. The well yes. the, the water that you actually access with a well. That's groundwater. So if you're not putting if you're just throwing it in the air all the time, you're yeah. never getting that recharged again and your groundwater goes down. So is this your ground here? Yes, this is part of the ranch. Uh, there's 77 acres in this field. So 
I mean, the thing that you were saying about uh, flood versus sprinkler is so true. Yeah. One, it's, it's harder work to do yes. flood irrigation, right? Yes. It, it, people don't think of it, it's, it's efficiency, so they, they're talking about efficiency like we use less water, but what they mean is you don't lose any in the groundwater, so you're not recharging anything. Right. But it is less work, so it's easier. Literally, you can, totally. he's, you're saying cell phone. Turn. These guys can phone. turn their pivots on with their phone. I've seen yeah. it. Yeah. They're connected right to the pivot and, tower. And guess what? If you got to apply a herbicide or, or a fertilizer, you dump a big tank out next to the center pivot, and right. you turn on your phone, and it'll apply it per acre, however much you want on there, just by turning your cell phone on and hitting the buttons. When I was growing up, we used to mow it with a sickle bar, and I'll show you the tractor with the mower on it good, because good. we're actually going to use it. I, I'd like you to see what a mower it looks like and yeah. how long did that take? I mean, that's... oh gosh, we we're two days mowing this, and then you got to let it dry for two days, and then you rake it and you let it dry for two days, and then you small baler, and then we go around with a low boy, and everybody picks up the bales and throws it on the low boy, and then you take it to the stack and you put it in an elevator, and it goes up the elevator. You hand stack everything. And now, that's just to get it stacked. Bricks. And then you had to yeah. feed it. Yeah, then you, know? you gotta feed it. Yep. Yeah. So he's talking about small squares are what, 60 to 80, 50 to 80 pounds, depending yep. on what you want to put up. Yep. But, and, and most people nowadays put up round bales or big squares. This here is the Kleinschmidt Canal. Oh, okay. That's and this is where we get our water. That's the water, okay. And this canal runs over to Fowler Lane and from the mouth of the canyon, uh -huh. Defauer Lane is 26 miles. Okay. And that canal was hand dug. Ooh, yeah. I, I've seen ditches up by, in the mountains by me too that were hand dug and go, wow, yeah. that was. Our oldest water right is uh, 1898. You've been here a long time and means you really care about the land and what oh, happens man. to it, don't you? I mean, it it's, gives you something that's- Gives me goosebumps, man. Just, pretty deep, isn't it? Yeah. This house was built in 1954. My grandfather gave my dad an acre on the corner of this quarter section to build this house. In 1954? In 1954. I was born in 1954. Okay. Oh, you were born here? Yep. Born okay. and raised my whole life right there. I see. This barn here was the milking parlor. The holding pins on the other side where we had them before we brought them in. We had three stanchions. We used surge milking buckets, two, is with it, a vacuum pump. Is it full of storage or is there? Yeah, there's storage in there now. And then the cows, when they got done, come around that three stanchion corner and they exited the barn here and they went back out to the pasture. Okay. Boy, milking is so much fun, isn't it? You know, when you get up at four in the morning and- We had to do chores before we had day. breakfast. Right. Which and we had to much, feed the cows before we did, had breakfast. How long did that take before Half breakfast? Half an hour. Half an hour before breakfast. Had yep. to put the machines, the milking machines together. Right. You know, and then run over to the hay feeder and throw some hay to the cows, get back, eat breakfast, get on the bus, go to school, get off the bus, put the machines together, go up in the field, get the cows, bring them in, put them into the holding pen. We milked, the most we milked was 65. Oh, with you two buckets. Wow. With two buckets. Yeah, so my dad used to do that too. Now, when you're milking, back then, lots of people had, they were diversified in a lot of different areas. They had yep. a, a few things here and a few things there. And then how would your milk get to the main sellers? Was it a, a okay, milk truck or? Well, uh, originally we had the milk cans. Oh, and oh, you poured in the milk cans through a filter. And then you had to cool those in spring water. They're, and they're, then we got a tank. Warm coming we out got of a cow, bulk tank. Right? A bulk tank, okay. Yeah. So we had like a 600 gallon bulk tank in there. Okay. Uh, the parlor is separated into two sections the bulk tank, the wash sinks, where the buckets, you know, the milking equipment was there. And then the back part was the three stanchions. And then they would put grain through the ceiling of the barn. And Did so it would go it into or? three chutes. So we'd have to go upstairs and fill the bins. Oh, okay. So that when the cows were milking, you could pull the handle and bring the grain down because a happy cow gives more milk. Oh, oh, absolutely. <laughs> yes. Know? And we had cows like old Maggie. She'd reach her head up through the stanchion and she'd grab that rope 
oh, she, oh, yeah. she'd grab herself another deal. <laughs> and my dad, you know, he'd kind of cuss at her a little bit, and then he'd have to tie that up to the side so she couldn't reach it. She couldn't it. reach it again. Yeah, huh? when she'd come in, he'd tie it up to right. the side. You're not getting it. Yep. And then you sold the milk directly to people then? or uh, We used two dairies in Bozeman. Uh, Kessler was the original one that we sold to, and then we switched to Dairy Gold. Okay. And we lost both of those uh, processors in in Bozeman. Uh, when was uh, that? Probably in the late seventies. So this is a very typical story of what's what's happening, and one of the, one of the reasons and one of the things I harp on a lot is the, that we had inefficient, what we call today inefficient systems, right? Lots of little producers. Total. Right, yeah. and there was distribution for those producers right here. The, yeah. you know, Dairy yep. Gold. You you went yep. right to it, and they went right to the customer. And now yep. it all siphons right up. So we're efficiently siphoning all of our money right up to a few people and making them extremely wealthy. Yeah. But w all of that we money. We used to. We used to value add. Exactly. Right here. Exactly. But now, you can't because all the money's gone now. It exactly. goes straight away from here. Yeah. It, a lot of times out of the country. But well, and. I don't know if you, you, I'm sure you've talked to some folks, too, that if you have a box of cereal with a six-month shelf life, you can hold it. Right. If you have a cow that has to go, it's got to go. Exactly. If you've got a wheat crop, mm -hmm. I mean, you can put some silos up and bins and stuff like that, but at some point, you got to move that commodity. Yeah, it costs money it to keep it It has spoilage. There. Yep. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. Keep and, it good. And, and so, like the packers... They own from field to table. Yep. You know, they, they, they have don't got into technically own it, but yeah. they control yes. all the way from the bottom to the top. And that's. Well, and you look at the, like the, um, the grain business. Uh, oh, the I got a friend out terrible. towards Madison out there uh, that he buys his seed from Monsanto. Mm -hmm. He cannot sell any of, his, any of his product except to Monsanto. Yeah. So they have his seed that he has to buy. Mm -hmm. Where are you going to get the seed? Yeah, exactly. And once you harvest the crop, you can't sell it anywhere else. You, you can't market it, you know, as Which a is local. exactly the same way that the, right. the, the packers control the system. Yeah. They just make it impossible for you to do business without them. Exactly. It's, it's not that they're saying you can't. It's just they make nope. it all nope. so you can't do it. You and can't. then we... The problem I see, and I want to get your opinion on this, is I see the problem with subsidies is you're trying to put a Band-Aid on a problem, and instead what you do is you just pacify, number one, you pacify the farmers so they continue to do what they're doing because then they, right. they don't have to make the money in the grain. They just get the money from the government. Yeah. But the, the second thing is that money they get from the subsidy goes directly back to the producer that's in, usually in Japan or China. Yes. With the grain market, I'm saying. Right. So we're just subsidizing the big companies right, right. through the small guys, right? The, the small guys are not doing the farming and the ranching for profit. Right. Okay. They do it because they love it. We used to make things locally and regionally. And we used to sell them locally and regionally. And what that does is keep the money in your community, which turns over many, many times. What we're doing now is we're shipping our money directly away from all of our rural communities to a few major global corporations. What I do is make videos and live streams showing the real lives of people who live in between the cities, who care about their family values, and who sustain land and food security that we should all care about. If you care about those things as well, then make sure you join this community. It's time to stop hiding in the shadows and let people know what rural families do for their country. I'm Trinity Vandenacre. God bless. So go to lifeinthewest.com right now. Right. And because of that love and connection, and you might see it in how I feel about this ranch, to try to keep it operating, it's not profitable, but it's it's something that's in your heart mm -hmm. that you want to keep doing. Well, these subsidies prey on that. Exactly. You want to keep ranching. You mm -hmm. want to keep farming. 
you want your kids out here on the ranch and maybe helping you. I know you're not making any money, but we're going to help you. Right. <laughs> we're, we're from the government. And we're here to help yeah, you. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's always a dangerous <laughs> thing, isn't it? Yeah. And, Man. and one thing I always tell people, Trinity, this is, this is so true. There's lawyers that when you hire a lawyer, you put another one to work. There's right. no other business out there, a mechanic or a plumber or electrician or any of those businesses where if you hire one, you usually are taking a job away from somebody else, but not an attorney. You hire one and you put another one to work. Ranching, on the other hand, is the only business out there where you buy retail and sell wholesale. Right. Now, right. how exactly how in the world so you're buying it high selling it low this is the opposite of what you're supposed to do in yeah. any kind of a profitable <laughs> venture is buy totally you're supposed to buy it the other way around so yeah. absolutely yeah. and it and it, it's because they're small yes they have no buying disjointed power. right uh, which is the way it should be it but, should be but they because yeah. of that they don't have any control when you have only like a couple companies controlling yeah. The entire market, right? So totally. in grain, I, yeah. I was up in the north. Um, you know, I was originally from Conrad. Mm -hmm. Well, Rocky Mountain Front. Yeah, it's all grain country up there, and yeah. the grain businesses that buy grain. There's only two of them. Both yeah. of them. One's based in Japan. The other one's in China. Yeah. They don't even. They're not even owned in this country. So right. your your grain and seed and you know everything is going through these guys. Well, how about the railroads? They used to have a 98 car train. And when they pull into the elevators on the high line up there, those elevators carried enough grain to fill a 98 car train. Okay. Well, they switched them over to 109 cars. You got to have enough storage for fill 109 cars. I well, see. they didn't. You go up on Highway 2 up there and look at the new grain elevators. Mm hmm. Who oh, they're they, huge. Who are they being built by? China. Yeah. yeah. China owns the storage on the elevators. So. It's like what we're talking about here is you end up owning, if you own the infrastructure and the buying power, then when when a farmer sells his grain, he doesn't really have a choice. It's the no. same thing with this milk deal. It got They passed a few laws that made it hard for people to sell directly to customers, and that shut these small businesses we down. We fought in legislature for three sessions on trying to be able to sell raw milk. Right. And our argument on the other side was... Raw milk is bad for you. And right. I stood up on the house floor and I told everybody, I said, first 15 years of my life, I was dipping milk out of the milk tank and putting it on the kitchen table on my cereal. And I stand before you today. Right. <laughs> exactly. I mean, that's, that was raw milk. Exactly. That mo both of my parents grew up on raw milk and the cream, yeah. you know, yeah. scooping the cream off the top. My dad yeah. always loved that on his cereal, yeah. you know. Well, they try to, like the farmer's market, they try to control those entities yes. that are selling at the farmer market well you didn't get this inspected well you need your eggs inspected well you did you know what is that it's putting the little guy more pressure and regulation on the little guy to make it harder for them to stay in business yeah but and it's in the name of trying to keep the consumer safe what well, this is this is something that baffles me because yes i see you know you want regulation to keep your food safe but then now that we have only a few companies running our food, if anything goes wrong, like yes. the, they've served, they sold raw, uh, rotten meat over the entire United States before they even knew right. what happened, right? Because it's distributed by one person. So then, yeah. instead of one little problem, you have yes. everything wrong immediately. Oh, you got huge chicken farms. Yeah, huge hog farms. Oh, that huge. Once you get an infection within that, it disrupts your whole supply chain the, the across, whole thing yeah yep. across the united states and then it also instills a little bit of fear in the public and you know yes you mentioned exactly, kind of a, exactly. a, a fear factor yep environmentalists use fear to sell their agenda absolutely we are destroying our environment we are burning fossil fuels and polluting the air uh wednesday is going to be the oral argument on the hill case where the 16 young children have sued oh, that's the right. state of Montana right. for not providing a clean and healthful environment, which is in our constitution. That is unreal. Which is not defined. No, no. But if it's not defined, who defines it? So Maybe the Chevron case? Well, that's what I'm wondering. <laughs> so the Chevron case, so the Supreme Court 
ruled something unconstitutional, which is called the Chevron case. Yeah. Uh, but it's been on the books. 1984. The yeah. 40 for, years. For 40 years. So yeah. what did that actually do? What did it do that, what did it roll back or what did it do originally that now is going to be okay. changed? Okay. Originally the Chevron case in 1984, Chevron sued. The courts, Supreme Court said the law passed by Congress is ambiguous and ill-defined and therefore we're going to give deference to the agency to define the law. Okay, so just making it so that anybody in an agency can define the law however they want. If the law is not clear. Okay. So when I was in legislature, I fought on every bill that I passed and some that other people brought to the floor, I tried to remove rulemaking authority from the agency. But every bill drafter, and, and it, it, most all the legislators will, well, the agencies for sure, they would stand up in committee and they would say, we have to have rulemaking authority in order to implement the bill when it becomes law, if it becomes law. And I said, you don't need rulemaking authority if the language in the bill is clear and plain and tells the agency or whoever what the law do? applies to, mm -hmm. you shall, you may, you must do whatever. But they would write the bill in a way that it was up for interpretation. So oh, absolutely. when it got to ask court, I've seen these bills that yeah. are written so vague. It's so like, vague. This could apply to anything. Is that why they did that? The think, administration or? fights for that oh, okay. because they okay. want to interpret. Sure. Okay. But you should revert back to the intent of the legislation, legislative right. intent. The person or legislator that brought the bill, what was he or she trying to do? What were they trying to fix or, you know, <laughs> mess up, right. whatever. whatever they were trying to do. But with anyway, the bill, what, yeah. what was their intent? <laughs> so you would look at the testimony by the legislator in the committee hearing, both sides of the House, say in Montana, uh, and then the argument on the House floor and the Senate floor as to this is why we need this bill. This is what I'm intending to do. But in the Chevron case in 1984, the court didn't have to consider intent of legislature. They just shoveled it off onto the administration, onto the executive branch and these agencies and said, you define it. So by rule, agencies have been creating rules throughout the year and whether they apply to the Endangered Species Act or the Multiple Use Sustained Yield Act or the Organic Act or the Enabling Act or any of these laws or regulations out here, the agency has created a rule. Congress can dissolve the rule, object to the rule, but they never do. Right. They let the agency do it. Mm -hmm. It has the force of law. A rule by an agency has the force of law, unless it's challenged and overturned by the judicial system. But the Chevron case said, judges, you will give deference to the agency who wrote the rule. So it's no okay. longer the law. Right, that doesn't, that doesn't make it, it doesn't fair. Matter. It's just like whoever made the rule, they're, That's we're gonna take their, I yes. see. Now mm. what the Supreme Court just did the other day was say, no, 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 no. The administration and the executive branch and agencies do not have the authority to make law. Right. So Which now is, you have to revert back to Congress. What did Congress do when they passed the law? And you might have to look at the intent, go back to the Constitution. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a very powerful thing that the Supreme Court did. And there's a lot of people out there, especially the agencies, that are very upset about it. Oh, I'll bet. So which, which agencies are we talking about here? Which, which agencies could Department kind of, of Agriculture. basically make up laws? That's Department of Interior. Department of Education, Department of Commerce, Department of Justice, every agency that's out there, Department of Defense, 
every agency out there was making rules to implement legislation that was passed. And like you said, it's very unclear in these laws that are written by Congress on it's open to interpretation. So now I go back to attorneys. You can have the same law and you can have an attorney on both sides arguing it means this. It means this. That's why you have attorneys. They are interpreting the law. And they will use a rule to supplement a law, depending on, they might argue against the rule, they might argue for the rule, depending on which side of the argument that they're on. Okay. The agency, I'm defending them, Department of Justice, I'm defending the agency. If you have a litigation against, say, the Department of Commerce or Department of Agriculture or Department of Interior, you would think that, like, the Forest Service under the Department of Ag would have attorneys. They don't have attorneys. It all goes to the Department of Justice. That's where the attorneys are that defends the executive branch throughout the nation on every agency. Hmm. So Department of Agriculture doesn't care if you sue me because right. the money's coming out of the Department of Justice. Right. So so let's let's get into this so it kind of applies to people. Like, so this last, we may have to understand a rule to, to see what this would affect. So mm-hmm. recently, the Biden administration created a rule for BLM ground. Or so basically, BLM is public ground in the West. It's yes. vast expanses of millions yes. upon millions of acres. Yeah. He created a new rule. So this would apply to this because it wasn't passed as a law. No. Right? It was yeah. just implemented like, here, I'm going to make a new law rule on... BLM, which could affect every everybody. It will affect everybody, and what it does is it creates conservation leasing, and it elevates conservation leasing to the same level as cattle grazing, oil and gas gra- uh, leasing, mineral leasing, any other lease on federal ground managed by BLM, and there's 8 million acres of BLM ground just in Montana. Right. I think they manage 200 and some million acres nationwide. But just take, for instance, Montana. So Tracy Stone Manning, who originally went to school in Missoula, she worked for the Clark Fork Coalition, uh, an environmental group, and she was actually involved in a tree spiking incident where uh, the Clark Fork Coalition was spiking trees to stop logging. And actually one of those trees went through a mill in Idaho and, and uh, one of the mill workers got hurt. But she was implicated in that case and we fought against her um, con- confirmation. Um, she was put up for the job by Senator John Tester. Now, Tracy Stone Manning went to work for Senator Tester as his state director. She later went to work for Steve Bullock as his natural resource advisor. So she's okay. been working in the democratic scheme of things for years, heavy into environmentalist uh, groups and supported by them. And then she hired Martha Williams. Martha Williams came out of Fish, Wildlife and Parks in Montana under the Bullock administration, and she's pro-wolf, pro-free roaming bison across the state. She's do not delist. She was opposed to delisting the wolves. I mean, all of the environmental stuff. Now she's ahead of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Mm -hmm. Well, Tracy Stone Manning just adopted this rule, the conservation leasing. Okay. When you have BLM ground, Mm -hmm. it has a management mandate. And that mandate comes from the Multiple Use Sustained Yield Act, which requires these grounds to be productive for the benefit of the people, for resources, for timber, oil, gas, grazing, all of those things. She took this conservation leasing, leasing and elevated it to the same level as all other production on these grounds. So now say that you have a lease 
for cattle grazing on BLM land. And that lease comes up, and I think it, they're on a five-year uh, rotation on adjustment of your lease amount. I might be wrong. It might be 10 years, but I think it's five. So that lease comes up, and they put it up for bid. Now, who is a rancher who has three months maybe of grazing on BLM land, adding value to his cattle, pounds? Mm -hmm. He's buying grass. Right, he's, that's grass. what he's buying. Yeah, yep. he's buying mm -hmm. grass. He has a lot of input costs on that land. He might have to put up rotational grazing, cross fences. He's got to put up water facilities to water the cows. He might have to drill a well. Pay he riders. has a lot of expense, mm -hmm. you know, range riders, yep. whatever. He has a lot of expense on that. So his profitability is minimal on his input cost, which is all of those maintenance costs and the lease price. Mm -hmm. And maybe he pays $5 or $10 or $20 per AUM, mm -hmm. animal unit per month. Right. So he pays for that lease. Now he's bidding against an environmental group. The environmental group comes in and goes, I'm going to leave this in a natural state. Conservation leasing, I'm buying pollination. I'm buying wildlife habitat. I'm leasing it for all of these deals. But Trinity, what else is he buying it for, leasing it for? Carbon credits. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. Is this something <laughs> that these companies will try, uh, companies who are, trying to make good with the ESG or whatever. Yeah. They're trying to get in good with the global thing so they can look good climate-wise. They don't have to change anything if they buy one of these carbon or these uh, Well, the federal leases, government right? comes in and says, you are putting too many tons of CO2 in the air. In order to offset that, you're going to have to find some carbon credits to buy, to give to us, in order for you to be allowed by us to put that much CO2 in the air. Right. So, so just to be clear, the carbon credits are mythical. Yes. They aren't adding anything or taking anything away from the air. They're not changing anything in their business. No. Carbon credit is just something the government made up like, oh, this land has carbon credits. Yeah. Bing. And then a company buys them, these mythical things, and therefore yeah. doesn't have to change anything in their business or do anything different. Right. They just eliminate cattle off that land, right? Yep, and so what occurred a few months ago, and I work for an organization called Citizens for Balanced Use, and we advocate for multiple use recreation, access to our public lands, active forest management, and responsible resource development. And we're a staunch supporter of private property rights. Within that organization, we started in 2004, and within that organization, we work with a lot of organizations uh, around the state and legislators and, you know, governors and everything. But we work uh, closely with American Stewards of Liberty out of Texas, Margaret Byfeld. And she came from a family, Wayne Haig, who the BLM confiscated his water from his BLM lease. Consequently, they couldn't run cattle. And they fought that for 27 years. Uh, Wayne passed away. His wife, Helen, got killed in a car wreck. Um, but uh, Margaret is the daughter, and um, they lost that case ultimately in takings court out of a Washington, D.C. court, some court shopping. But anyway, we, we work with them, and what came to light was NACs. Do you know what NACs are? I don't think so. Natural asset companies. Oh, yes, now, I've heard of these, you but I don't take, understand them really. Okay, so say Nature Conservancy comes in, or the federal government on a national park, and they enroll Yellowstone National Park, 3 million acres or whatever, into a natural asset company. So now there's a pool of land that is available to apply carbon credits uh, on. Mm -hmm. So these natural asset companies, these land trusts and the federal government, maybe state government, can enroll their land in there. And so now they have a amount of carbon credit that's available. Okay. And out of, out of thin air. Yes. Out of thin air. And this is global. 
So say China wants to look good on their pollution, I'm going to purchase carbon credits and that's going to give me the ability to, on paper, right. reduce my carbon emissions because I'm putting carbon into a carbon sink. I'm collecting carbon in mm -hmm. this carbon sink, undeveloped land. Right. Where a cow is emitting methane gas, mm -hmm. it's a polluter. Right, right. But a natural process right. is not. Yeah, e even buffalo, fires. Buffalo yeah. never do. They, no. They have four stomachs just like a cow, can breed with a cow, but they don't do anything that a cow does, right? Right. Buffalo are good, cows are bad. I understand. <laughs> I got it. I'm always on that train. Yeah. <laughs> so these, these natural asset companies uh, applied with the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, to be allowed to be traded on the New York Stock Exchange. So now you have a natural asset company that has control of carbon sink, and it has a value because companies that are polluters can buy these carbon credits in these natural sinks, and then whoever enrolls this land into this natural asset company gets reimbursed from the investment into that through the New York Stock Exchange. Gotcha. So, so who, in, then... who invests in yeah. our national parks like Glacier and Yellowstone and these conservation easements? Say that our ranch right here, we don't have any conservation easement on it. Mm -hmm. We don't want to give control to anybody except us and what we do on our ranch. A lot of these ranchers and farmers are enticed into doing that because of either inheritance and tax purposes or they get a lump sum money for putting their conservation easement. A one easement. time that one, lasts forever. One time. Yes. The, the one time to buy this conservation easement. Yeah. And then the agency who you set, buy it from or sell it to has yeah. control over certain aspects of what you can do in your land, right? Right. Yeah. So they, um, the natural asset company onto the New York Stock Exchange gets foreign investment out of anybody around the world and these conservation easements because the land trust enrolled, they own that in perpetuity forever. You lose control of that. Mm. So they go on there and Russia or China invests and now that natural process on your private property is now owned and controlled by a foreign adversary right or anybody dubai right India. you know you gotta understand this is not like a mythical thing so basically no. what he's talking about this is not this is not some conspiracy theory this already no. has they've been tried it did they get it succeeded the, in it the sec they, dropped it because they it, were getting a light shined on well yeah because people actually noticed what was going on they yes. were just trying to slip this thing in onto the Yes. They didn't pass it anywhere. Nobody made a rule. They were just trying to slip it right on to the New York Stock Exchange as yeah. a thing yeah. without passing it anywhere. Nowhere. Basically yeah. allowing foreign entities, foreign companies, or countries to own rights to all of our property exactly. or any property. Anything yeah. that was enrolled in these natural asset companies. Right. And talk, at a, and talk about profitability. Because somebody's going to come in and say, you're polluting so many tons of CO2, and mm -hmm. I argue that it's a pollutant because our grass out here depends on CO2. Right. In fact, greenhouses pump CO2 into their greenhouses to make their grass and flowers and everything grow. Mm -hmm. They they want to up it, the level. Ex exactly. <laughs> yeah. So that's what, what the... The, the process of photosynthesis requires CO2. So, yes. Yes. But they call it a pollutant. Yeah, for some you reason. Know? And it's a very minimal part of our, of our atmosphere. But then again, our education system, kind of going on a separate track, has failed our children in not um, teaching them where your food comes from, mm -hmm. where your materials to build your cell phone comes from where the metal in this old truck comes from. Mm -hmm. And Conrad Burns, uh, Senator Burns from years ago, a good friend of mine, he, he had the best statement in the world. 
you either grow it, mine it, or you don't have it. Right. You know, yeah. nobody's teaching it. So this is the old 92. My dad bought it new. Oh yeah. And that's got a Cummings diesel. So this is a 92. Was this the first year they put the diesel in it or? Yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. With the Cummins, it's uh Yes. It's the uh, I love the Cummins. What do I they have... call it? The uh first gen. First gen. First gen. So do you remember at all how much this cost new? It was about thirty six hundred. Thirty six hundred dollars. Yeah. And now a new one costs <laughs> like I think it's like eighty-five or ninety thousand for one of these for a Dodge. Yeah, I saw you're driving one, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm driving a two thousand ten Cummins. Yeah, love the Cummins. That's a good engine. One. That's why I buy them is because of the engine, really. It's... So this one oh, wow. is the old forty-eight uh, Dodge. Oh wow! That, this uh, might be a little dark, but you're gonna be able to see it a little bit. My dad bought this new. Oh yeah. It was the first Dodge car bought from Rolf and Best in uh, Bozeman. And then I helped him restore it and uh, got it painted, overhauled the engine, transmission. I was a uh, mechanic, uh, started mechanic in 1972, worked for dealerships, line mechanic, and um, started my own business in 1986, auto doctor, and uh, Wrenched that for 35 years, and then a couple years ago, I was uh, kind of changing some tires and blew a couple discs in my back. Oh no! I went to the doctor, and he said, "You gotta quit. Probably better and quit go, doing oh, that." Man, yeah, I don't want to quit, man, because I love wrenching. So, what is this then? It's this a 48 is... Dodge Club Coupe. 48 Dodge Club Coupe. Wow. Yeah. What a what a car! It's really a nice car. Oh, you yeah. kind of get a kick Look out of the, that. this visor here. Is that a ram on there? The, on the hood ornament? Yeah, looks like it. Ram Sinclair or something. Yeah. Oh, wow. Look at that. And then these are the spotlight yep. spotlight on there. I saw the, yeah. the attachment for it on the inside. That is pretty cool. Fog lights and stuff. So this oh, my, yeah. this is uh, my mom and dad, and my dad was a uh, county commissioner for 12 years in Galton oh, County. Okay, okay. And my mom worked for the School of Architecture as secretary. This is my grandfather and my grandmother, uh, oh, Delmer yeah. and Ann. And uh, my grandfather had lightning gas in Bozeman, he was a distributor of fuel. Oh, was he? And okay. This is my great grandfather. Stephen. Well, this is the great grandfather. Yeah. This is the one that that came to this area then. Yeah, and there was an old barn between here and Townsend, and on the roof it had lightning. Yeah. And, and I don't know if you remember that. Lightning barn. I know exactly where lightning that's barn. at. Well, that Absolutely. was it's my lightning grandfather's barn business. That's why he it put says, that sign up there. That's yeah. why it said lightning on it. Yeah. See, yeah. nobody around there, because I've asked a lot of people, no, yeah. why in the world that barn said lightning on it? That was so it said lightning on it because it was his advertisement for his company? Yep, lightning, well, look yeah. at that. So this is Lightning Barn, for those of you that don't know, Lightning yeah. Barn is right along the highway there now. Yeah, it is. Um, still intact, owned by the Watsons. Yep. And uh, I and just I, never you knew. You know, you can actually kind of see some of the letters yep. in, that, yep. in that roof. I just, yeah. I just never, I've asked so many people why that said lightning on it. Really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I'm like, why is yeah. it a lightning barn? Why, is it something that gets struck by lightning or something? But no, okay. Yeah. Interesting. But these are some of the old brands. Uh, oh yeah. That are ours. Yeah, a big old uh, O. What's the, what's the zero for? We there? had the uh, bar circle. And oh, the bar that's quarter a circle. circle. Gotcha. And the bar quarter circle was a cow brand. And that was on the left hip. And this is the, so this is the circle here. Yep. And that's the quarter circle right there. Yep. See the so we had bar quarter circle and we had circle, uh, bar circle. And then we also had uh, bar quarter circle horse frame. 
And the horse brands were smaller? Yeah. You usually put them on the cheek? Sure. Yeah. So it was a jaw brand? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. My dad's is a hip brand, but it's they're all the same thing. It's just yeah. different just, placements. So you could have the same brand. Right. You can register the same brand in every location of a horse or a cow. So he might yeah. own like... Yeah, the bar, uh, the bar quarter circle is uh, on the right hip. And then the bar circle is on the right rib. Okay. So there's two different locations, even though they're two different brands. Exactly. Yeah. They and these, location. you have to pay for, some people don't know this, you have to, to maintain these brands, you have yeah. to continue to pay for them. Every, every 10 years. Every 10 years, you have to pay yeah. again to register that brand. That means that yeah. that brand means you. And if you don't register, yeah. it goes back out into the brand book and somebody else can buy it. Right. Yeah. And there's a brand book out there. You can go through it and you can see there yep. might be some brands that you might be interested in that they have let go that might be available. Yeah. Or you can design a brand and apply to have that brand and where you want it on the animal and then get it certified. And they have to assess whether it's close, like if it's too close to some other brand, yeah. they won't allow it because back in the old days, I don't know <laughs> if they do now, but back in the old days, if you had a brand that was too similar, they could make something to cover over it yeah. that that made your brand into somebody else's brand. So that's why they're trying yeah, to- Yeah, that bar quarter circle, you probably make it into a bar circle on the same, you know- Sure, right if, sure, yeah, exactly, <laughs> that know. kind of thing, you know? Yeah. So they didn't want, they wanted, but- They so, had wrestlers. Exactly, they yeah. had wrestlers. What's this chain thing? That makes woven wire. That makes woven wire? Yeah. How in the heck does it do that? So you feed the wire through I the can holes. You see the handle over there. You see the, feed the wire through the holes. Okay. You make uh -huh. a couple of turns forward and then you pull it down to the next one. You put a wire through them, then you turn the wire back the other way. Then you put a wire through and then you turn the wire this way. Oh, and so what it does wow. is it, it twists that single wire in between each one of your little panels by twisting those wires. Each one of those little holes in the wheel, uh -huh. one wire goes through each one of those. I see. Okay. And then when you put your wire through to line those up, when you twist that, it twists all six of those. All six of them together. And then you put a wire through, and then you twist it the other way. And it locks that wire in place in between those squares. I see. And so with just wire, you just buy wire, you know, and like electric you, fence wire. So this is... You make woven wire. This is not actually for making woven wire like to sell and put on a roll. It's like no. mo making woven wire while you're fencing. Yes. It's like you just buy yeah. the wire and you put it in there and yeah. as you're going, you're twisting it together. I see, cool. Yeah, and you got, you know, your top one. Yep, top and, one's a little higher. Right. And, you, and it's you got a, the crank handle up there. So you need 14 rolls of wire. Oh yeah, 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 because it's two, two in each one. Cob. Yeah. And then you have your extra wire that you're gonna make for your ups, I call them stays. Yep. Okay. And then you to keep, twist it to the keep other it way. separated. And yeah. you twist back and forth so that you don't wrap up your whole Ga balls of gotcha. wire. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Three around, three back. Three okay. around, three back. Hmm. And it, we have some old homemade fences wire like down that? at the wow. lower ranch down there. Huh. And an old saddle. Those things were. Man, they used to build them saddles. If you sit in any of them old saddles, they don't fit a horse very well anymore. No. Because I think our horses, number one, were shaped a little different. They were a little thinner. Yeah. But and they didn't care as much about how it fit a horse. But man, are they nice to sit in. They oh. they were built for somebody to be able to sit in that thing. Look at all, how all the time. high the back is. Yeah. It, <laughs> it's high front, high back. I mean yeah. yeah. And exposed stirrup leathers there. Yeah. That's pretty cool. I was looking at something the other day from NACO, which is National Association of Counties. They have a map of the United States. You can click on any county and you can look at the demographics and the change. It goes back to 1920. And I oh. was looking at Eastern Montana and most of those uh, counties out there are losing population. Yep. And it's rural cleansing. We're moving people away from rural America towards the cities. Some of it's regulation. Uh, some of it's commodity prices, some yeah, a, of it's... A lot of it is the fact, what we were talking about earlier, the fact yes. that because of the the situation right now is so efficiency and corp, big corporate is good, 
that that you're you're siphoning all the money away from those those communities. There's nothing for them to do to make money. No, nope. and they can't stay on a family ranch or farm because that's right. not doing any good. And right. and right now the calf prices are high, so everybody's yeah. doing. They're they're like, yes, we're finally getting a little break. The problem is, is that the cost of producing a calf has gone cost. way up. And if yeah. that price that you're getting for a calf right now goes down and those costs won't go down, that's going to be, we're going to see way more of what you're talking about. Those right. small communities are going to feel it right in the shorts. Yeah. This is going to... Got... Oh, I can't believe... You have a... Make sure you go to lifeinthewest.com and join my community so you get an email every time I upload because YouTube doesn't email you or notify you every time I upload a video. Because next week we're going to continue this tour and you're going to get to see what's inside Carrie's shop. But you're also going to get to learn about how environmentalist groups have actually stopped being environmentalists and now have turned it into a business model of taking millions of dollars of tax money just to pay themselves to continue to fight anything whether it's the wolves or grizzly bears timber it doesn't matter what it is they're using these as tools to make money and we're going to discuss that next week so make sure you go to lifeinthewest.com join my community and subscribe to my youtube channel uh, like this video as well if you thought it was helpful until next time i'm trinity van den god bless